Well, good morning. We are celebrating Mother's Day 2021 and in an era which unfortunately does not celebrate motherhood the way it should be celebrated. I'm so glad that we have a day to celebrate motherhood and to celebrate mothers and to show the value that should be shown to this office. Um, I want to say thank you before we go any further to my mom, Doris Judd, and to my mother-in-law, Diana Tibbs, and to my step-mother-in-law, Missy Bennett. So we love you all, and we'll dive in talking about motherhood. We're going to look at several things today, and the main word in all of these is going to start with a P. Um, first of all, being a godly mother is a privilege. Being a godly mother is a privilege. Another way of saying that is this, it is God who opens or closes the womb. And I want us to look at some passages that relate to this. First of all, in Genesis chapter 17, in verses 15 to 16, And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a son? Excuse me, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, um, which means he laughs. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. And if you turn over the same book of Genesis to 18, look at verses 9 to 15. Uh, there's a follow-up to this. And they said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, She is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a son now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh. For she was afraid. He said, no, but you did laugh. And then skip on over to chapter um, chapter 21. As we fast forward here. 21 verses 1 to 3. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age. At the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And again, that means he laughs. So God is the one who opens or closes wombs. It's not just in this story with Abraham that we see this, but on uh, in the Old Testament, if you go to the book of Judges, right after the book of Joshua, Judges chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, it tells us about the birth of Samson. We won't read the whole thing, but just these few verses here. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. There was a certain man of Zorah, the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. If you turn over to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 1, and verse 6. This is speaking of Hannah, who would be, become the mother of Samuel. Uh, and her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. Now that sounds severe. The Lord had closed her womb, but he had. And there was a reason. We'll talk more about that. Look at verses 19 to 20. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. So again, we see the Lord in his time opening up the womb. 
Look at the book of Luke. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 and following. In the days of Herod, king of, Jude, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes, statutes of the Lord. Much like we don't read anything negative about Hannah, and yet the Lord had closed her womb. Here, they're walking blamelessly. But verse 7 says, But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. And then you guys know the story. It goes on, and um, Zechariah is a priest, and he's in the temple. And the angel appears to him and tells him that they're going to have a child. Um, skip down to verse 13. The angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And uh, he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So it is God who opens and closes wombs. Being a mother is a privilege. You see, being a, a biological mother is not a guarantee. Uh, there are many women that want to have children that can't. And so being able to be a biological mother is a, is a privilege. Let me say this, life is always a gift from God, however it comes. Now we know that the Bible teaches that sex is to be saved for marriage, and that's how children are to come into the world. But what about when uh, a couple um, sins and has sex before marriage and a pregnancy results or say there's an adulterous affair and a pregnancy results or there's a rape and a pregnancy results, what, what, what then? Even then, life is always a gift from God. Life is always a gift from God. And what God has done in those circumstances is out of a sinful situation, God is so good that he has brought something wonderful into the world, the gift of life. Um, turn to the book of Psalms and look at Psalm 139. Life is always a gift from God. Every pregnancy is a gift from God, no matter how it comes. Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Every life is a gift from God. There are no accidents. Um, there are no accidents. Every person is intentionally formed by God. And he has their life planned. So every life is a gift from God. Now, God's timing has a purpose. Okay, We looked and we saw several examples of couples that for whatever reason, uh, they, they weren't able to have children and then God allowed them to. His timing is perfect. What he was doing is in the parents through the timing and what he was going to do through the child by the timing of their birth. Uh, for example, God used, Herod, uh, used Hannah's barrenness to draw her to him and to mold her heart to where she was prepared to give her child Samuel to the Lord's use for all of his life. She was going above and beyond with the vows of the day. And she gives him to the service of the Lord and Samuel becomes one of the most well-known judges, one of the most well-known prophets of the Old Testament. And God closing her womb for a while was so that he could then bless her and use this child in such a strategic way. We saw with Manoah and his wife, they weren't able to have children until God ordained it and had Samson born at just the right time to be the judge who would overcome the Philistines. Or what about Elizabeth's womb being closed? 
again, closed for so long and then opened so that John the Baptist would be born just in time to be the forerunner of the Messiah. Timing is of the Lord. Whenever God closes a womb, he has a purpose. Sometimes he's delaying, yes, but there are women that want to have children. And they're faithful. They love Jesus. They love the Lord. Their husbands love the Lord. And they're still not able to have children biologically. And may never be able to have children. What then? Well, God has a purpose. God may prohibit a woman from being able to have her own biological children so that she can become an adoptive mother. Ronnie and I have dear friends who this is their situation. They wanted to have children. They couldn't. And now um, they're the adoptive parents to a, a, just an adorable a young man and young woman. And, and we have so much fun when we get to hang out with them. And it's just a joy to see what God is doing in that family. It's amazing. Or sometimes um, I'm thinking of two single friends, again, of mine and Ronnie's, that two single ladies that have wanted to be married, that have wanted to have children. And they're still not married, still don't have children, probably in their late uh, 40s. Um, what then? Well, again, I, I've seen these young women, or, well, I, say, I say young women, sorry, um, still seek to honor the Lord. They're older than me. But um, to honor the Lord, despite not being married, despite not having children, I, they've served as teachers. They've served as uh, leaders with youth. And they've been, in a sense, mother figures um, to those who, in some situations, perhaps didn't have a, a godly example of a mother. And so God doesn't waste anything. If God has opened your womb to have children, own that privilege, appreciate it, embrace it, fulfill your ministry as a mom. And if he has closed your womb, understand that it may just not be his time yet, but that his timing is perfect. Or it may be that he wants you to be an adoptive mother. Or he may want you to be a proper mother figure to someone whose biological mother has failed them. And he wants to use you in that way. So being a godly mother is a privilege. Well, number two, being a godly mother is a partnership. It's a partnership. Turn to the book of Titus. The book of Titus. Look at chapter 2, and verses 3 to 5. Paul writes this, Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. Here it comes. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Notice the, what the top two things are. The older women are to teach the younger women. They're to train the young women to love their husbands and children, okay? There's, there's a partnership if you're a mom. You're in a partnership with your husband. In fact, if you turn back a few pages to the book of 1 Timothy, um, there's a passage, um, but some people consider this controversial. It, it shouldn't be. But Paul is giving directions about roles for women and men in the life of the church. And some people want to say that, that what Paul is writing here is really just for the church of Ephesus, where Timothy's at. But that's not true, because in verse 8, he makes it clear that what he's um, saying applies to every place. He gives instruction to the men first, but it's in every place. And then he comes to the women. So again, it's every place. And he says in verse 11, Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. And then he goes right into chapter 3 where he starts talking about the qualifications for a pastor. And so this is one of the passages where we see that though men and women are equal, they have different roles. And so the role of a pastor belongs to a man. And he gives two reasons why he doesn't allow a woman to have this role. He says, first of all, the created order. And again, this is not a cultural thing. This transcends all culture, all time. This is just the way it is on planet Earth. God created man first. 
But then he says, um, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved. That doesn't mean eternal salvation, but it means making your life count here um, through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. There's a lot there. Let's unpack this. What he's hinting at here is the partnership that is meant to exist between a man and a woman. Okay, Some commentators come to this and they say, well, there's two reasons here that a woman's not supposed to be pastor. One is created order, and second is because of what happened in the fall. Um, that's kind of like her fault. This is a consequence. That's not, I don't think that's what Paul's saying here. Rather, again, he's hinting at what happens in creation. There's a created order. Man's made first, then woman. But also the way we're created. Because there's something going on here. I want to be careful how I say this so I'm not misunderstood. There's something going on here to where even before the knowledge of good and evil, the man somehow recognized something's off here. The woman was deceived, but the man understood something's off. And it says not that one's better than the other. It has to do with gifting. We're going to get to that in a second. The man realizes something's off, but the woman was deceived. But the man still chose sin. Okay, And you guys, if you remember theology, Adam is a representative of the human race. And by this one man's sin... Death comes into the world. And because of Jesus, the second Adam, the last Adam, by his righteousness of this one man, the God-man, Jesus, now life is available to all. Okay? So what happens is this. Even before the knowledge of good and evil, there's something in the man that he's able to recognize what's going on. But then the passage hints at this gift of compassion that women have in childbearing. It says, if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. And here's what seems to be going on. He, he, and I want to be careful to say seems. It's, it seems to be that it's hinting at the fact that we as men are able to kind of compartmentalize. Generally speaking, men can kind of shove their feelings to the side and look at a situation and, and analyze it. Okay? That's not saying that women aren't discerning. That's not saying there are not some women who are more discerning than some men. We're speaking in generalities here. Men tend to be able to compartmentalize. Women are more in tune with compassion, more in tune with their emotions, generally speaking. Okay, that's not to say there's not some men that are more compassionate than some women, but generally speaking. And so what we see here is there's this complementary gifting where a husband and wife function well together in when they intermesh their giftings. Okay, this is kind of self-evident. When a child falls and scrapes their knee, who do they run to, generally speaking, mommy or daddy? They run to mommy. If there's a snake in the yard, who do they run to? Generally speaking, they're either running to daddy or they're running to mommy because they know daddy needs his hands free to take care of the snake. My wife and I were actually talking about this situation. And she said, well, I remember one time there was a snake and I went running to mom, but that's because dad was mowing and I went running to mom to get her to get dad to come kill the snake. <laughs> okay, you see what's going on there. So being a godly mother is a partnership. You bring your gifts and your husband brings his gifts and together you work. And so what it says here, she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness and self-control. It's not just, you don't just make your life count by having kids, but it's being the right kind of mom with those kids, of continuing in faith and love and holiness with self-control. And again, he's Paul's not saying that every woman is going to be a mother. Paul talks elsewhere about the fact that some people are called to singleness. But even then, as we've already seen, oftentimes single women who don't have children of their own function in a motherly role for um, children that don't have a mom. Okay? Um, it's important as, as husband and wives work together as parents to present a united front, that you're partners in this thing. Okay? Um, I remember this only happened once that I remember and we found out real quick it didn't work that we had gone to I think my mom to ask about doing something and she said no so then we went to my dad and asked and he said yes so then we went back to mom and said well dad said we could we found out real quick that that was not going to work and they made it real clear that we were not to try to divide them that they were united and then if one said no the answer was no okay uh, this is also, I've, I've heard it mentioned before, it's important that some discussions perhaps need to take place not in the presence of children, so that when you come, there's a united front of the parents together saying this is 
the plan that we're following. You see, knowing your role helps your children know their role. Children need to understand their place, that, uh, um, that the mother loves their father, and that that partnership comes first, and that they're a result of that partnership, okay? Or in an adoptive situation, you're adopted by this partnership, okay? And when children understand who the parents are and the parents' role, it helps them understand their role, and there's security in this. Well, being a godly mother is also a priority. We were just in Titus where he talks about older women teach the young women to love their husbands, love their children. Those are top two things. It's a priority. In fact, even in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul is writing about uh, younger widows. And he says, so I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. So, Again, there's this priority on motherhood in the Bible. Don't ever let being a mom be kind of an add-on to who you are. Some people in our culture treat being a mother like a charm that you stick on a bracelet. Well, here's another one. Stick that one on. Here's another one. Stick that on. Or it's like a, if you remember, flashback to the 80s. Remember when people wore jean jackets and they put all kinds of buttons and patches on them? Some people try to treat motherhood that way. Well, I'm, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, and oh yeah, I'm a mom. And no. <laughs> Being a mom is not, being, being a wife and mom is not a thing, it's the thing, okay? It's a priority. Number four, being a godly mother is a picture of God's protective love. Turn to the book of Matthew. Being a mother is a picture of God's protective love. Matthew 23, and look at verse 37 and following. Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But this picture here where Jesus says, How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. He's using this mother hen and her protection of her chicks to illustrate his love for the people of Jerusalem, the way he wanted to protect them and, and offer them his salvation. So too, mothers are a picture of God's protective love. Um, I just had a flash in my mind, a friend of mine who was a hunter and he was in, in West Virginia and it was bow season and I don't think he had a gun on him. And there was a baby bear that was coming up near him. And he's trying to get it to go away, get it to go away, because mama bear's real close, okay? You don't want to miss a baby bear, because mama bear's going to get you, all right? Well, when mothers are protective of their children, it's a, it's a picture of God's protective love. Next thing is this. Being a godly mother means being a provider. Turn to Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31, the passage on the virtuous woman. And we'll go look at a couple of verses here. It describes the provision of a godly mother. Look, first of all, at verse 14 and 15. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. So she's providing food. Look at verse 21. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her children are clothed in scarlet. Okay? She's providing food. She's providing clothing. You know, um, my mom, I remember growing up, made a lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, or she, or she made this thing called goo. It was like a peanut butter and syrup put together, goo sandwiches. We really liked those. And made a lot of sandwiches for us to, you know, send us off to school, providing food, providing clothing. Of course, this is something the mom and dad work on together, right? Um, but I, I remember, you know, we'd be out shopping. It was time for school. We needed uh, new clothes. We'd outgrown them, and we're out, we're out doing that. And so a godly mother is a provider. And again, this is a picture of God, because as you provide your child uh, food and clothing, it's a picture of God who provides us life, breath, and all things. And also, it's a picture of God who gives us spiritual food. Um, he gives us the word of God as our food and 
Jesus himself is the bread of life. We're to feast on him. He is life, gives us life. And your provision for your children with physical clothing is also a picture of God's provision for us of spiritual clothing, that we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Well, being a godly mother is a powerful thing. Turn to Psalm 127. I love Psalm 127. Psalm 127, verses 3 to 5. Um, I teach archery at camp, and that will tie into this verse here, okay? Psalm 127, 3 to 5. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward, okay? Again, life is a gift from God. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver, who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Speaks here of children being like arrows. Now, like I mentioned, I teach archery, and the great thing about arrows is this. I can reach out like this with my hands. I only reach so far. With my feet I only reach so far. But if I take a bow and an arrow, I can launch that arrow way farther than I can reach on my own. That's how children are. In a couple of ways. One way is this. Generally speaking, generally speaking, apart from tragic circumstances, children outlive their parents. And so as a parent, you're able to impact a future time that you'll never see. And you're able to impact that time through the godly children that you send out into the future. They extend your reach. Another way of looking at it is this. Even while the child is living, that child is able to be in places that you can't be on your own. I can't be here and out there, but I can be here and send an arrow out there. It's the same way with children. So being a mother is a powerful thing. You're able to reach times and places through your children that you can't on your own. And you're able to extend the influence of Jesus and uh, proclaim the message of Jesus through your children in places you may not be able to go and in a time that you may not be able to reach. So being a godly mother is precious and praiseworthy. Turn Turn back to Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. Look at verse 28. Speaking of the virtuous woman, it says this. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Being a godly mother is precious and praiseworthy. Listen, being a godly mom and receiving this kind of praise from your children and from your husband, that means more than any Grammy Award, any Oscar, any Tony, any CMA or ACM Award, any Dove Award whatever award you want to fill in, business award, whatever, getting this kind of praise from your children, from your husband, that's it right there. Being a godly mother is precious and praiseworthy. I mean, after all, think about all of the roles that an average mom fills. Let me just list some of them. This is not exhaustive. On any given day, when you're raising children, Moms, you're a bodyguard. Sometimes you're a lifeguard. If you're with them while they're swimming. You're a nurse. You're a counselor. And that changes throughout the years what kind of counseling you're doing. You're a sports coach. You're a life skills coach. This is how we brush our teeth. This is how we comb our hair. This is how we... Uh, you're an actress. And you're playing make-believe with your children. You're a cheerleader. Letting them know they've done a good job that they can do it. You're a cook. You're a sanitary needs assistant. A lot of white noses and other things. You're a toy mechanic. Some of you are intimately acquainted with Legos. You're also a Bible teacher to the student body right there in your home. And you're one of their best friends. So being a mom is precious 
and praiseworthy. Well, thank you, mothers, for all that you do. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Keep pressing on, and thank you. Happy Mother's Day. We love you.